Awesome. Try it again. 10. There nine, we go. Eight. I put you on mute. <laughs> How rude. I know. <laughs> this is not the 1950s, Colin. Uh, you cannot they, be doing that to they had... female employees. <laughs> You're muted is like the theme of 2020 anyway. When you, when you said that, I was like, of course they had mute buttons back in the 50s. I didn't go to like the sexist route. I'll just mute the. <laughs> uh, well, I was responsible for the preamble and the intro. So like, hey, we did it. Thanks. Uh, welcome to the show. Welcome to SDR week, everybody. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your day, out of your week to to help us celebrate the people that I, I think don't get enough appreciation in the, the sales and revenue cycle. Um, so to all you SDRs, we love you. Thank you for supporting the account executives um, and the, whoever it is that, uh, that you might roll up to uh, and, and uh, book meetings for. It is one of the, I think, hardest jobs in sales, if not the hardest job in sales. And uh, we appreciate you, appreciate everything you do, which is why we wanted to have SDR week and and try and sort of highlight some of uh, some great people in the space. And hopefully along the way, we can make some people feel good and we can uh, all learn a little bit. Um, and today we're talking about cold calling. Sarah, why don't you, uh, why don't you run with the intro here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much guys for joining us. Um, yeah, it's absolutely one of the hardest jobs in sales. Aaron Evan calls it the Benjamin Button job of sales. And I think that is absolutely accurate. You start in at the ground floor and you grind and then you work your way up um, to something else. And he, he often says, you know, if you ask any account executive at this point to, to go prospect themselves, they'd be like, I don't want to, I don't want to do it again. So good job. All of you grinding it out. It's an incredibly tough job. And today our guest is somebody who is no stranger to that grind. Uh, he's been, he's done SDR work. He's managed SDRs for many, many years um, with a focus on prospecting and personal brand building. James Buckley uses his prior sales experience to teach teams how to create and leverage their personal brand to bolster pipeline, connect with strategic accounts, build relationships and add value to the sales process. In addition to his role at JB sales, James publishes the say what sales blog and is also the manager brand ambassador and podcast host of the Uncrushed podcast. Welcome, James. Thank you very much for having me. This is such a pleasure. Uh, you and I go back a long way, so it's great to finally be in this moment together right here. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and can we get a, get, give, me, give me a one in chat if you're an SDR. Um, give me a two in chat if you love your SDR. Uh, so <laughs> that, and uh, James, I'm super pumped to have you on here. I feel like we connected 100 years ago to, you were one of the first like <laughs> 10, 20, guests on our podcast back in the day right. when, when I still ran the podcast um, and then graciously pass it off to Sarah. But the that's not where I want to start the conversation today because that'd be a very long conversation. One of my favorite moments was when Sarah turned around to me and we were, this is back a couple of years ago, you had just started and you're like, the nicest thing just happened. So why don't, why don't you two tell that story? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was prospecting a list of people. One of the people on said list was our friend James here. And of course, not somebody, somebody that I should have been prospecting, not a fit, somebody that had been on the podcast, somebody that I, I should have been able to look and say like, okay, not the right person, but I was new. And I, I you know, hadn't seen that podcast episode, didn't know what I was doing. Um, as you know, I was doing the classic like flounder before the the three or four month <laughs> click for the, um, the SDR role. And so prospect to James, he graciously responded and said, like, not a, not a fit. I was on the, the podcast with Colin, um, like love what you guys do, but I'm not the fit. Mm -hmm. And I responded just being like, I'm so sorry, y you know, like should have known that, but uh, honestly, I'm new. I don't know what I'm doing. Sorry. Thank you for your <laughs> reply. Cause some people would just be like, mm, unsubscribe spam, whatever. Um, and James was like, well, Sarah, like I've been managing SDRs for, for years. Like if there's anything in particular that you're struggling with, let's hop on a call and I'll, I'll gladly chat to you about it. And I was like, oh my God, James, I'm only struggling at the moment. <laughs> like there's only things that I'm struggling with. I remember so we, that. <laughs> yeah. We got on a call, um, and you're in Florida. So opposite ends, uh, of the country. Cause we're up in Vancouver. And I remember thinking like, how cool is that, that. I'm able to have a conversation with somebody so far away, but, you know, be connected in, in this moment over this one particular topic. Um, and I explained how I was struggling and the biggest struggle for me was cold calling at that point. I think it's, it's often the biggest hurdle that anybody has to get over. Um, but I just felt that 
I was so nervous for any cold call because the stakes were so high in my mind. It's like, oh my God, I have to try and convert this. And if I say something wrong, I'm not going to. And then at the same time, I was struggling to consistently hit my quota. You know, I was like yep. feeling that I was scraping all the meetings together and I would like finally get that last meeting on the last day of the month and for a second have a sigh of relief. And then it would roll over to the first of the next month. And I'd be like, oh, I have to do it all again. So just feeling very overwhelmed at that point. Um, and James just had some incredible words of wisdom, basically um, telling me to sort of like take the power back myself. And um, that was the kind of sentiment around the cold calling piece. It was like, it's you who's doing this. Like you're trying to learn, you are trying to have that conversation. Like it's not, don't put all the onus on or all the like power in the hands of the other person. Um, and that was a great piece that was like, okay, cool. Now I can cold call consistently um, and not, yeah, feel like I want to rip my hair out. And yeah, just, <laughs> we just had an incredible conversation and it honestly was this pivotal moment where then everything clicked. And then I was start. I was able to build that pipeline in a comfortable way, hit the quota, not panic on the first of the next month. And so I 100% attribute James as like the reason that I stuck the job out because I 100% did not want to stay. <laughs> I was like, I made a mistake. I don't want to do sales. I hate it. It sucks. Um, but I just, I just hadn't found it. And, and James helped me. So thank you, James. I remember. Yes, absolutely. And I'm so glad that we're here in this moment. Like I said, um, I think a lot of the reasons why people are afraid of cold calling is fear. They're afraid of rejection. They don't like the sound of their own voice. So they think that it's going to rub somebody the wrong way. Um, they're afraid that they might stumble over their words and sound like uninformed or not knowledgeable. I think it's an ego thing in a lot of ways, that fear. And it the fear knows no bounds. It can take many shapes and forms. But once you figure out like, your flow, the thing that works for you, great opener, great calls to action, ways to get people to want to talk to you about what you're talking about. Uh, I think it all kind of unfolds and I'm excited to dive into that today. So looking forward to this conversation in a big way. Right on. And Chad, give me a three. Let's participate here. Give me a three in chat if you've ever felt the same way that Sarah did. Um, I know I think I probably, I didn't have a, a James that I, I magically reached out to um, in the middle of mine, uh, my stint as a, I, I was never a full-time <laughs> SDR. I was, I always had to carry a bag, but it, it was the same. I, I had the same sort of, uh, stress anxiety because you go from, you spend a month prospecting, then you spend a month having those meetings and they spend a month closing those meetings. And hopefully you remember to, you know, spend some time prospecting in between. And so for me, it was like, uh, it was the same thing, but stretched out on a quarterly cycle of like, Oh, I hate this job. Okay, it's not so bad. Oh, fuck, I'm I'm like behind on quota. I'm gonna get fired. It was mm. like every single quarter. I remember hitting my hitting my quota in Q the beginning of Q two. Uh, I hit my quota for the year, and then by the end of Q four, we were having performance conversations with my boss because, like, he's like, we haven't closed anything in three months. I'm like, yeah, I closed all of my pipeline in May. Like. What do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think there's this element for sales reps. They're kind of split down the middle. Some reps are like the go get it. Let's do it early reps. I want to hit the number as fast as I can. It's a, it's a sprint, not a marathon type of reps. And then other reps kind of, kind of say it's a marathon and I'm going to, I'm going to hit it in the end, no matter what. And then at the last minute, it's a hustle, hustle, hustle. I think it can work both of those ways, but I kind of like the middle where it's a planned, it's a plan of attack that, you know, you, what your equation is and you can work the numbers to be able to be sure that you hit that goal consistently over time. And it's not so stressful. You don't feel like you're working at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, trying to hustle and get the number in. Uh, that feeling has never been a positive feeling for me. And cold calling has always been a way to shortcut that process of consistent outreach because the moment I get you on the phone, uh, it's it's pretty effective. And I think people perk up. I've had a lot of folks, especially lately, say, it's so refreshing to get a call. I never get calls anymore. Everybody sends emails or reaches out to me on social and a lot of it's canned. Uh, so when you finally get somebody on the phone and what you have to say is really impacting them, they're like pleasantly surprised 
to enjoy the conversation because it happens so rarely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, and things have changed quite a bit in 2021. Uh, so I'm happy to dive into that too. I think it, it used to be about KPIs and metrics. You know, you can go back as soon as 2015, 2014, even before that. And it was very, we gotta make this many calls to get this many meetings. And that equation is really important. You need to know that equation. But today I think it's taken a new form and it's become more about like first impressions and you know gaining that attention with a cold prospect and adding that extra channel to your outreach process. I think we tell people all the time, like everybody's like, oh, I don't make any calls anymore. And if I do call, I'm certainly not leaving a voicemail. And we tell people like leave the voicemail because it prompts people to reply on other channels like social and email. You know, they hear that message. They remember your name. They, they remember deleting your message, right? <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's how it goes. And you know, anybody that thinks that every message everywhere gets read, it doesn't. Uh, so that call is a, a great window for that, but it's also about building rapport and being consistent, um, earning credibility, right? Anybody that's afraid to dial somebody's phone number, it's kind of hard to give you credibility in that space of sales, especially if you're selling to sales, uh, which so many of us do. Uh, and then you have an opportunity to provide value on calls that you typically won't get when you're sending an email trying to earn a conversation. Uh, and then, of course, qualifying and next steps have become a part of it as well. And it used to not be that, right? It used to be very like tone in my ear. I start talking. This is my script. If they say this, then I do that, right? And it's become so much more. And I think SDRs everywhere need to realize. And if you're out there listening, listen to me now. You are worth so much more than just being someone else's metric hitter. You are worth the first impression that your company has with a new prospect. And that is extremely important when you are someone that's talking to somebody else that did not expect to hear from you today. 100%. And so I, I, there's a couple things happening in chat. One, I'm not wearing a tie because I'm not a sucker and I hated wearing that tie. I was so uncomfortable mostly because my neck has gotten a bit fatter since I last wore this. So doing up the top button, I think was like choking me out yesterday. So Hebran, uh, Freddie, that's why I'm not wearing the tie. Secondly, and most importantly, um, we had a lot of people resonate with sort of Sarah's story. And I, maybe we could just deviate for a minute and talk a little bit about mindset and like how you got over that. Because I certainly remember having, I mean, I, I had that anxiety as an AE Hey, I also did cold calling when I was starting what turned into predictable revenue. Um, I would cold call for 90 minutes every day for an investment banker. Um, and I had that, that anxiety when we first built the sales team, I had that anxiety scaled up amongst like at, because I was the AE, then we hired an AE and I had that anxiety for this person. So like, how did you, I'll, I'll finish with me, but how did, how did the two of you get over that or does it ever go away? Ladies first. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it, it definitely is like a reframe in your own mind because nothing, nothing physically changes about these calls. Um, I mean, your tone of voice and stuff may, may change once you have the thought, but it really, it's like a, a frame of mind switch about the purpose of these calls. So if I came in thinking, like in this call block, I have to book a meeting. I have to book a meeting because I have to get closer to my quota, because if I don't hit my quota, I'm not going to get paid or I'm going to be, you know, put on a performance improvement plan or whatever that might be, but putting some, so such high stakes on it and saying that like the number one and only goal is booking the meeting on that call. That's, that's a lot of pressure that you're putting on yourself. Mm -hmm. Also, that's usually not what happens. Like there's so many different types of conversations that you want to be able to have with these people on the phone. Um, some of them are not going to be the right person. So you need to be like agile enough to go like, oh, great. Okay. So that's the right person have they mentioned any struggles? What tool are they using? Who do they work with? Like if you're going for the meeting mindset, you've got like three questions that you're going to be able to ask. And it's the set qualification questions. And if anything is thrown at you, you're like frozen because you, <laughs> you're not, you know, capable of having any other type of conversation. So if you're going in saying like, okay, I'm going in to learn about this company and I'm going in to discover something about this company to help me get to the meeting. It may not happen on this phone call, but I can always phone again another time and say like, we talked about this and here's why I think, you know, this is a good fit or I can, you know, it, it having the intention be to learn on that call 
changed everything. Cause even, even as I'm talking about it, like my body is more relaxed to say that I'm going in to, to learn. Whereas if you're going in to book a meeting, if you don't, that's like the end of the world. And then you end up with these, like, you know, the high of like on the phone and then a big crash when that person says like, no. Um, but if you go in with some really good, like open-ended questions of, of, uh, certain things that you want to learn about that persona, about that company, about their company in particular, if you come in prepared with those types of things, it's a completely different type of conversation and, and, and like the panic goes away. Um, and you end up more likely to close for the meeting anyway, because you're able to like dig in for pain and, um, discover challenges and then be like, Oh, cool. We solved those problems. Is that worth the discussion? And they're like, yeah, sure. Whereas if you go in and you're like, I, we help, we build sales teams for people who don't have sales teams. And then they're like, we have a sales team. And you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it dies on the vine, right? I've there. seen you make yeah. that call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. She um, makes the same, I, I same noise it. too. <laughs> I, I, I got over it when I started asking myself, how am I going to get this person to want to talk to me? And that became the question to ask before I dial anybody's phone number. I think circa like 2015, 2014, it was really simple to be that one app, that one thing, that one competitor in the market. There was no one else out there. You could probably set those folks that have that specific model that's set up where it's just they're one of a kind and you can put headsets on them and it doesn't matter who they're calling they can roll through all kinds hey what's up thanks for taking the call do you have a minute yep great let's the reason i'm calling is i'm talking about this i'm talking about that i want to set it up and show it to you can you you want to check it out if you're the only competitor in the market for your space that's probably a, an easier conversation to have than when you're a cold caller calling in and there's hundreds sometimes thousands of options out there for buyers. And they know that because most buyers are pretty well researched. So it's important that there's this moment in your calling and in your connection, like early on, how can I get this person, this human being to want to speak with me further, to be interested enough to connect with me? I see this all the time. Lots of people are going to talk to your prospects and talk <laughs> at your prospects, but very few people are going to connect with them. That takes a real knowledge of who they are, what they do, what they're responsible for. If you, I say this too, if you read their about page, you'll learn a lot about their love language and how they like to be spoken to, how they <laughs> talk to people. That's really important when you're a cold caller, because if I'm cold calling somebody and they're data oriented, I need to talk to them about data. If I'm calling them and they're more cerebral, I need to make this person feel good. Knowing that alone changes everything about what you say to them. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got over it. I started to actually give a shit about who I was talking to. Love that. And we'll, we'll get to the regular content in just a minute. I'll, I'll answer with a shorter version because I think I would totally agree with what, you know, Sarah is saying in terms of the unconscious, unconsciously competent and sort of James, I feel like what I was hearing or the, what sort of resonated with me was the, just like understanding the outcomes that you that you potentially help them achieve. And to me, that's one thing that I would like think through in my head before the call, because you're interrupting them, but that's, and that certainly is the cost, but the benefit is largely, largely, largely outweighs the minute cost of, Hey, I'm going to take 30 seconds of your time to see if I can create this like million dollar in value. And to me, that's a great exchange of value there. The thing that I would, and, and that's sort of the, it leads into my journey into philosophy and I'm not going to talk about it, but I will say the three things that I, I, I tend to remind myself is to control your perceptions, to direct your actions accordingly, and then willingly accept what is outside your control. And to me, that means I, f I make sure that I reframe in a positive way what, how I'm thinking about the call. I make sure that I calculate and I hit my numbers and I hit the activities that I need to do during the day to feel good about um, what I've done. And then I make sure I accept that what is outside of my control is the outcome of the call. What is in my control is how prepared I was, how well I handled the call, how well I knew my material. And if I do all of those things that are within my control exceptionally well, and I'm happy with my with the job that I've done, everything else doesn't matter, right? And that's a really important and a hard piece to let go of when we're paid for all those other things. Um, yep, yep. 
I agree with you. We're paid for the outcome and it's weird. It's like a, it's like an irony that we can't escape. If you are able to detach more from the outcome, you can more closely attach to things like value and delivery and inspiration and all these other things that make your prospect feel good about investing in you and your product and your service. So it's so odd that those two things are juxtaposed, but mm -hmm. leaders are out there saying, I'll compensate you for results. And people that are, that are selling need to be less focused on results to boost results. There's this like ridiculous circle that we all run in every single day to run on the wheel, as I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I want to want to just build on something Sarah said earlier, um, and that you know the you thought your job was to sort of sell. Your job was to pitch when they pick up the phone, and this is one of those like misconceptions. So why don't we build on that? Because I know we would sort of plan to have that conversation. Yeah, totally. Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions I think that we have about cold calling, and that's one of the biggest ones is that sales reps are taught, especially SDRs, they're taught that their job is to sell. That is not your job as a sales development representative. Your job is to create interest and get attention. Attention from people that you were not expecting to give me their attention, first step. Create enough interest and connect those dots enough that they're excited and willing to learn more from you and or your team. It is the AE's job to sell. Your job is to create enough interest so that you can open the door for that AE to sell. Here's where I think the problem comes is, and this is like an AE SDR relationship issue, you know, big, big talking point here. Feel free to put your thoughts in the chat or let me know if you've thought about this, you know, put a two in the chat if you've ever thought about this. We work for months to build relationships with decision makers as SDRs. We know the research is clear. It's like 16 to 20 touches to generate a meaningful response conversation style with a cold prospect. Then this person, for whatever reason, unbeknownst to us, decides to drop their rapport enough to give us the time of day and take the next step and do a demo. The person on the other end that receives that connection and does the demo is not as invested as the SDR is after months of outreach and rapport building. So they're detached from the outcome and the, the SDR is 100% bought in to the outcome. So here's my tip for you as an SDR, attend to the demos that you set, show up, edify the AE, introduce them, give a little history on them if you can, make it so that it's a smoother transition and the relationship can be built between these two individuals. And you're gonna find that you acting as that conduit helps that deal stay nice and greased and people feel comfortable doing business all the way through the sales cycle. Um, so, you know, I hope there's a lot of twos in the chat. I don't know where you're seeing the chat. I don't see it. So, uh, but if you've ever felt that way, I know your pain and it is very easy for an AE to kind of give like, you know, and I don't want to, nobody's like downing AEs here, but like, it, if you're not as invested in this prospect as I have been for the last three months to get you this meeting and it shows that prospect might not decide to move to the next stage. So that's a misconception. It's not your job to sell. Uh, and another thing, and this is John Barrows, like in my head all day, every day, mm -hmm. he said something to me that changed my life. He said, it's not our job to convince somebody that they need what we have. It's our job to sell what we have to those that need it. And that is totally different because the more we convince and the more we persuade, the more the expectation gets. And then no matter what they buy, they're probably going to end up with some buyer's remorse at the end of it because you've done such a great job convincing them that they need this. And turns out they didn't need it as bad as they want. I feel like I'm going to pause for a minute because that was a lot. <laughs> well, I'll let Sarah jump in here. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so interesting. And that's something that I've been chatting about with, with the SDRs a lot recently is like, with outbound, the reason that you get so few responses because is because so many of the people that you reach out to genuinely do not need what you have. So what yeah. we're doing when we're reaching out to these people is not trying to say like, get rid of what your solution is and have ours instead, because it, it might be completely perfect for them. 
Yep. What we're hoping to do is catch those people that already think that they are looking for a new solution or haven't actually like conceptualized that, but are struggling with what they currently have, um, or they have no solution at all. Um, and it's something that we touch on in the, the new predictable revenue formula. There's such a small percentage of people that are in a buying mode with outbound. And those are the people that you're trying to capture. So the only way to capture them, whether it be, uh, you know, through phone or email is by identifying the pain and uncovering the pain that they have. And then saying like, Hey, there's a solution to that. Not by saying you're, you know, it's a logistics uh, persona and you're saying like our TMS is better than any other TMS. And they're like, well, I have a TMS already. So like, I don't, I don't want to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But if you say something along the lines of like using an internal system for this, it's like time consuming on spreadsheets. There's a lot of room for error. Does that ring a bell? They're like, oh yeah, it does. And then you're like, there's a potential solution. And as you say, James, it's not then my job as the SDR to say, there's a solution and this, 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 and this, here's how it's going to be implemented. Here's what it looks like. It's just to say like, there's a solution. Is that appealing? And then if they say yes, you're like, great, let me loop in an expert to chat about all that. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our CRO is noted for, and he said this so many times, like anytime you're selling something, there's this really simplified mentality that we can adopt. Uh, Chris Merrill says, I have this thing. It's in my backpack. It can help you win. It can change things for the better. Do you want to see it? Cool. I'm going to take my backpack off now and I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is, is the job is to carry the backpack as an SDR. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so true. One of the an another great misconception, and I touched on this earlier when we were talking in the intro, is like people don't leave enough voicemails, man. Voicemail is just one more channel that makes you familiar to your prospect. It, put a three in the chat if you feel like you leave voicemails every day, all day, and you never get callbacks. Your phone does not ring half as much as it should. I, I can't see the chat, but I'm willing to bet that there are a ton of threes f flowing freely through the chat right now. My phone doesn't ring often, and I give my cell phone number out a lot. And you know what that tells me? People are afraid of the phone. They're afraid to connect that way because they're afraid they're not going to get where they want to go with it. But it also tells me that those voice messages will stand out for your prospects because they rarely happen. And because they rarely happen, if they are consistent enough, you will find that your emails get responded to more frequently. Your DMs that you're sending on LinkedIn and other social platforms get responded to much more frequently. Your follow back rate on places like Twitter and Instagram will happen more frequently. Sometimes I get DMs in my Instagram DMs and they're like, James, I'm getting your emails. I'm sorry I haven't gotten back to you, but I will. I wanted to let you know. Sometimes I get connection requests that immediately get accepted. And the response that they get back from me is, thank you for connecting. I'm sorry I haven't replied to your emails. I will as soon as I come up for air. Here's this perspective. If every single decision maker everywhere took every call from every sales rep, every time they asked for 15 or 30 minutes, no actual work would ever get done. And because of this, the cold call and the voicemail are that light touch that says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm on your time when you're ready to buy from me, when you're ready to explore, when you're ready to check it out. This is one of the channels that we suggest people use to stay top of mind, but without being that obnoxious sales rep that won't go away in my inbox, won't go away in my DMs, always is asking me for time and the next steps. Those voice messages carry you over the finish line when it comes to engagement and responses. All right, that was... Misconception number two. I have one more misconception, but what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I, I think let's let's keep going because I want to get to some strong openers, some weak openers, and then we got to get yep. to looking at some some of the messaging here. Um, so cool. Yeah. So so another conception that I I want people to understand is that people don't care who you are and who you're with, and I know that that is a tough pill to swallow because we want to start every call like this. Hi, my name is, and I'm with, and we do. And you know what? The moment people hear that they're done with the conversation. They're looking for that window to be like, no thanks, take me off your list. No mm -hmm. thanks, unsubscribe me. Nope, this isn't for me. So what we tell people to do is to find a different opener that is not about you. Um, and that kind of leads us to some stronger openers that I think are worth mentioning. So 
Colin, if you're cool, I'll dive into some stronger openers that we find to be really effective. Yeah, man. One of the best openers that we use is we say, thanks for taking the call. Do you have a moment? Sometimes we even qualify, is this the person? But we do it with a downward inflection. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But thanks for taking the call. Do you have a moment? Is a really powerful opener because one, nobody gets thanked for taking a cold call, super pattern interrupt right away. Mm -hmm. Do you have a moment is like a subconscious signal to your prospect that says, I am aware that this is an unscheduled call and I want to value your time as best I can. So do you have a moment? That is a strong opener. I strongly recommend that you run 50 to 100 calls. Use that opener. You're going to find that it can only, I, I only, the only way that that opener can get answered is one of three ways. Yes, I have a moment. What can I do for you? Great response. No, I don't have a moment. And if the answer is no, then you say, no problem. Thanks for the time. I'll call you again tomorrow. You will be amazed at how many people say, who's this after you say that? Because they don't know if they want that call tomorrow, right? And then the other way it can get answered is, who's this? And then you've earned the right. In all three of those responses, you have earned the right to keep speaking to this person. And that's the name of the game when you're cold calling. Um, that downward inflection, super important. When you talk to somebody and you have an upward inflection, I'm going to do this with, with Sarah right here. Sarah, I'm going to call you as a cold caller and I'm going to use this upward inflection. And I don't want you to say anything. I just want you to respond the way you would respond. Okay. Uh, hi, can I speak with Sarah, please? Mm, yeah, it's me. Right? Good. Okay. See how you're a little apprehensive? You're kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to take this call. And watch this. Can I speak with Sarah, please? Yeah, that's me. Much more assertive. This is, yeah, she. is. how can I help you? Right. It's true. And the it, reason it doesn't seem like you're a cold caller. It seems like there's that's something right. you're like important. We got business to do. I it's mean, not a cold business. Call. <laughs> that is, yes, you hit it on the head. I said exactly the same thing, but I said it with a downward inflection, which puts me in the authoritative seat. When we mm. have that upward inflection, we are already lacking credibility in the eyes of the person on the phone at a subconscious level. Again, the concept here, how do I get this person to want to keep speaking to me? Mm -hmm. Gatekeepers work exactly the same way, except in a lot of cases, I'll ask for their name. That way, when I call again, I can say, is this Dorothy? And Dorothy's super happy. Yes, it is. How can I help you? Dorothy, I spoke to you yesterday. This is James again. How are you? downward inflection. I'm good, James. What can I do for you? Can I speak with Colin, please? Colin's not available. I can put you through to his voicemail. Actually, I'd prefer you write this down if you don't mind. By the time it's all said and done, Dorothy and I are tight. She knows who I am. She knows my number when I call. She's picking up going, hey, James, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. This is great because she has the best access to the person I want to talk to. And I don't care what Colin's reason is for talking to me. Dorothy will walk in and say, Colin, James has called every day for a week. I take all of his messages. Will you please call him back today when you have a moment? And Colin's going to call me and say, I got all your messages, even though he didn't, because Dorothy just made him call me. And I'm going to say, great, Colin, the reason I want to talk to you is, did you read the message? Here's what it is. We need to put some time on the calendar, right? And that's how you break through that gatekeeper that consistently takes your message the guy never calls you back. The person never calls you back. You don't get the responses from the emails. That person is your ally, not some wall to be overcome. So don't look at your gatekeepers at enterprise level or otherwise as obstacles to be broken through. They are not. They are people too, just like you. So those are my openers. Uh, I, oh, uh, I, always, I always preface with when they give you the opener, you want to start with the reason for my call is. Because if you don't start there, at already they're they're probably disconnecting ready to be like is am i going to get a moment to hang up on this character <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what is the reason for your call i'm curious dorothy gave me all five messages so yeah so the reason for my call is that you're the vp of sales and i talk to vps of sales like you that run teams and my job is to make them more human in their prospect which yields better sales results when do you want to have that conversation love it nice. you'd be hard pressed to be like i don't care about my people being human goodbye <laughs> yeah my people yeah. are already human. Yeah, that's I don't not hire an zombies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I only hire yes men. I don't hire anybody else. Yeah. So, <laughs> so let's talk about the weak openers that we hear regularly that seem to not want to go away. Um, we talked about one of them and it's hi, my name is, and I'm with nobody gives a crap about that, man. You got to earn the right for them to care about that. And you do that through better openers and better communication. 
Um, the upward inflection makes you a weak opener all the time. Anytime you feel that and you hear it in your voice, take mm. a step back and try to focus on that downward inflection that makes you seem more authoritative and more serious, more businesslike. Uh, how are you today? Some people say this is a great opener, and I think there's a big conversation around this debate. I think it depends on the five minutes of research you do before you contact this person. If I'm reading somebody's profile on LinkedIn before I dial their number, and what I'm seeing is data and lots of results-oriented conversations and talk, this person is not going to respond positively to how are you today. But if I read their about page and what I see is words like motivational and inspirational and wonderful and exciting and, you know, those types of people are not data driven people. They are feelings people. So I want to talk to them and ask something like, hey, thanks for taking the call. Do you have a moment? How are you today? That's super fluid. And I feel like that would be appreciated by somebody like that much more so. Uh, is this a good time? It's never a good time. Stop opening with, is this a good time? And is it a bad time? Just puts the negative connotation in their brain. And it's super easy to be like, yep, this is terrible. I don't want to have this conversation. Thanks. Right. <laughs> uh, touching base, checking in, following up, bubbling this up to the top. Stop it. Just stop it. What that translates to for your prospects is I have no real reason for reaching out to you today. I'm just touching base. I'm just checking in. We need to remove the word just from our vocabulary as salespeople. Everything that comes after it loses value. So uh, sorry to bother you. I hear that one a lot. Oh my God, stop saying this. Sorry to bother you is like people going, oh, this is going to be a terrible conversation. Yeah. Great. Knock yourself out. I mean, right? <laughs> as Canadians, we're actually required to say that when we co-call. It's like to, to maintain our passports it's, it's built and into citizenship. Castle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, you could lose your citizenship so, it's if you don't say that. sorry though, right? It's sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to bother you, eh? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last part is people always ask me, what do I leave in my voicemail? Um, and this is the hardest thing to do, but once you get it, it's really, really powerful. You need a powerful introduction to start. You need the reason for your call. You need a quick call to action, not a big, long soliloquy about what you do. Uh, and you need the contact information on the back of the message, not on the front. So most voicemails go like this. Hi, this is James from JP Sales, and I'm calling about your sales team. Right away, you don't listen any further. You hit the number nine and you delete, <laughs> right? Because you're not expecting a call from James. You don't know JP Sales. And I don't care why you're calling me because I know none of those other things. So nine, delete. But this is the way we leave voice messages now. And notice a couple things. Hey, what's up, Colin? I'm not sure how many calls like this you get, but I'm calling you specifically because I'm pretty sure you're the person that's responsible for the sales team at Predictable Revenue. I'd like to talk with you when you get some time. There's no rush. Give me a shout when you get a chance. This is James from JB Sales. I'll shoot an email over so you know who, I'm at, who I am and who I'm with and all that fun stuff. Talk to you soon. That's it. I leave my name on the back end. I leave my company on the back end. I do not leave my phone number because again, no one calls you back, right? And my phone number is going to be in the email that I'm about to fire off right away. And that email is going to start with, Colin, I just left you a message. Guess what? My very next step, right after I click send on that email, it's going to be to hit LinkedIn. Colin, just shot you an email and left you a message. Looking forward to adding you to my professional network as well. James, cell phone number. I just like one, two, three'd him. And what I'm basically saying is, yo, man, I really want to talk to you. If he doesn't respond on one of those three channels in two days, three days, I know I've got to do more work. I've got to be more, more subscriptive. I've got to be more researched. I've got to be more relevant, more timely. All those things have to happen at the same time as my outreach. So lots to talk about there, but that's how I leave voice messages today. And it works really well for feeding the other channels. Nice. I love that. Yeah. I love pointing the pointing it back to the other channels. Cause you're right. No, there's no point in leaving a phone number. Like why, why would somebody listen yeah. to this phone message from a stranger and be like, you know what I'm going to do with my spare five minutes this afternoon, instead of having a coffee, call back that stranger. Just see what's just see what they're calling about. No way. No way. You couldn't, yep. even if you were like, there's no pow powerful enough language to get that person to call you back. So yeah, absolutely. You just need to use it to direct them towards the other things that you're going to do to get their attention. 
I, I got to counterpoint this because uh, like I'm, I mean, I remember cold calling in the day when my boss li- literally handed me a phone book. Um, and back in the good old days, people would return calls. They wouldn't return my calls, but there were certain, I think calling into certain industries and I, I can't say I never got callbacks. I did get callbacks. Same with, I've seen, uh, Tristan and Sebs, um, and Sarah, I believe you've got callbacks too on, on I think outreach. only, only in, yeah, really, really key industries. And specifically it was like the manufacturing space, like a traditional industry where people have desk phones and still, and they are generally, as we were talking about earlier, part of the old guard, yeah. um, who still do business that way. And they may go like, why is this Sarah calling me? Is she a client? Like what, what does she want? And then they maybe call me back, Mm -hmm. but I've never had like a, a SAS or, you know, software product company, anything like that. Um, call me back. I mean, we don't even have a phone system at PR, right? Like it's, it's It's important that you recognize who you're calling. Definitely. Um, Because there are certain verticals that will go ahead, James, certain verticals that just function on phones. You know, um, I know carnival cruise lines, man, they love the phones. They're cold calling everybody. Anybody that's been in their system in the past, you're getting calls. Hey, what's up? You want to take a cruise? <laughs> like that's, that's like the way they do it. Um, but it's important. You know who you're calling. If you're calling an industry that has 40,000 salespeople and they've been around since let's say 1951, there's a great chance that they have fallen behind on the tech space in some regards. They might still be operating Windows XP because their vice president is 76 years old and refuses to move forward from that because change is hard. And that's okay, right? But now you know that calling is probably the way to go with most of the members of that team because it's the way the company stays running. Here's the hard part. And this is for the callers out there that are startups, callers out there that are new to the space, callers out there that are brand new to your company. You do not stand a chance challenging somebody that's been doing the job for 40 years when you've been doing the job for three months. You do not know more about their company than they do. You cannot help them grow in any way, no matter what your product is. Leave that part of it to the people that actually sell the product and can explain it in a way to that veteran that makes sense to them. Because as a 25 year old, fresh out of college SDR, it's really challenging to call somebody that's been a VP of sales for 17 years and be like, I know more about this than you ever will. (laughs) No, you don't bro. No, you don't. So. That, and that's the way it comes across to these people, whether you mean it in that way or not. Again, tonality, inflection, all those things matter. Respect the people that you're calling and understand that they know a lot about what they do. One of the things I hate when I get calls, when people explain something to me and then end that with, does that make sense? What I hear in that moment is, are you as smart as me? <laughs> yeah. And you definitely not a great place to start the conversation. As you were saying that, I paused for a minute because I was thinking of all the time of, of times I've said, does that make sense? And like, yeah, I, it was never my intention to try and insult them and say, are you as smart as me? But it, cause it was, I think it was, and if I think about it, it was probably coming from maybe a bit of insecurity in terms of how I communicated the message. And so yep. removing that sort of insecurity, again, it's sort of the, do I make, does that make sense? Is sort of the upward inflection of words to put yeah. it in the silliest yeah. way the possible. upward inflection it matters in that sentence um another thing that we say all the time on calls uh right before you hang up you go what's my next step tell them what their next step is mm. explain to them how people buy from you and ask them how they buy stuff that matters because if you don't get that piece of education in an initial call you, how do you know what the next step is? You're expecting them to tell you what the next step is? Their response to that every single time is going to be, well, let me take a look, send me some stuff, I'll get back to you. And now you've begun the chase. And the moment you begin chasing, you've probably taken a step back towards closing that deal. Totally. I mean, I, I think- I do this all day, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have to get to, uh, to some of the lines here. So we'll make that transition 
um, in a few minutes. I would close we'll close on just agreeing with James and I'm I, Sarah. I'll give you a minute to weigh in. But I think the single most important element of any sales call is to end with mutually agreed upon next steps. When I started doing that, it was a total game changer um, in my professional sales selling career. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You need buy-in from them on that next step. Otherwise, often it's it's a like false hope that they're giving you on purpose to get you off the phone. But if if you get like confirmation that they have that pain first, then you as as James saying you ask like can I show you what's in the backpack? Like you've got the pain, you need what's in my backpack. Can I tell you what's in the backpack and show it to you and then they go like okay and then they show you show what's in the backpack. They're like, "Oh, I'd like to like take it out of the backpack and look at it." You're mm-hmm. like, "Great. My friend is going to do that with you." daytime get it scheduled in the calendar have them if you can uh schedule it like live and accept the calendar invite then and there um so that it's not only like a mutually agreed upon but then like in writing in the calendar it's that much harder for them to then go and delete it out of the calendar um but if they say if you say like are you interested in a meeting and they're like yeah and you're like okay great i'll shoot you an email with some times they're like dope i just got rid of that like i didn't want that anyway and now i don't have to do it so yeah i 100 percent agree a, there's a powerful sentence there. I just sent you the invite. It should be in your inbox. Do you see it? And it's such great confirmation that if they're not, it's like another check of like, is this yes. a blow off or is this an actual real opportunity? Because if it's a real opportunity, you know, they're going to ask more questions. But if it's a blow off, now you've got this awkward pause and you've so like, it, oh, I can't. My computer's not working. My computer's going through a tunnel. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> All right, let's get to some. Uh, let's get to some of the slides here now. Chat. This is the this is the moment of truth for you because we're going to need your help, your support, um, and uh, let us know what you think of uh, of all of these uh, all of these message all of these messages and lines to keep prospects on the phone because we want your input so that when we get to the very end, we could ignore it and go one, two, three, shoot, and pick what we want instead. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to read out, um, the first, first few lines here to you guys. Um, so our first submission is, is for a couple of different circumstances. They're from Hebron Quezada. Um, so in this circumstance, the prospect would like to get an email with more information. It's that, that old, don't want to talk anymore. Just shoot me an email some, with, with some more information. So Hebron says, John, I can imagine that your calendar fills up pretty quickly and ours tends to do the same. Would it make sense to set up a placeholder for next week and if need be adjusted at a later time? I like that. I like the old placeholder invite. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm pretty good about asking for a time tentatively and I just say we can move it if we have to. Yep. I love, you know what, I, I love, depending on where you are, um, sort of in the sales cycle, um, yeah, I think it's a phenomenal one. Doing it too early can be a real turnoff, but it also, again, it forces it forces the decision. So if I feel like I've gotten to a point where I've earned the right, then I think that's fantastic. I think used too early, I think I've used this too early, and then, you know, and just sort of as like the Hail Mary at the end, and, uh, and yeah. it's been a turnoff. Honestly, but if it is the Hail Mary, like why not go for it? Yeah, either there's like two ways to use it. The first way is you've done your due diligence. You've you've taken the backpack analogy even further. You've like, you know, they've agreed they want to see what's in the backpack. And then they've agreed that they want somebody else to to show them what's in the backpack. Then 100%. um, If they're saying like, oh, I don't have time to schedule right now. Be like, let me just throw a placeholder calendar invited in there. Just give the back and forth and we can adjust later. Um, Or you've tried everything. You've attacked all the pain points from all angles. You've tried to explain that what's in the backpack is so cool and they never wanted to see what's in the backpack. Sure, at the end, why not just, just give it one last go and say, you know what? I think you would like to see in the backpack. Let's get a placeholder. (laughs) <laughs> all right good. i, I like you win. curiosity play <laughs> yeah you could use it this better be um, a cool okay. looking backpack then, <laughs> yeah I, I really like that analogy mm-hmm. um okay the next submission uh also from hebran so the the circumstance here is the budget or time objection so not the right time right now or i don't know i don't have budget for a solution like this right now jane we understand that tech 
uh, indicatives don't happen overnight. We're more into learning about your efforts in particular subject, uh, like area of, of what your company deals with. Um, so we're, we're more into learning about your efforts in area and seeing if our product can fit your roadmap for when it would make most sense. When is your budget being reviewed? What do you guys think about this one? All right. I've got a few things to say about this one. The first one is I think indicatives should have been initiatives. Um, uh, and then the second one, and then the second one is that I'm not a fan of things that could be obvious merge fields. So when you have a specific industry that you're shooting for, the temptation we have because of the existence of what used to be what I lovingly refer to as the death of spray and pray uh, when, when that was a thing, it was really easy to use merge fields. And before we knew about merge fields, there were like heavily about them. There were pieces of personalization that we thought were really meaningful. Oh my gosh, they used our name. They definitely wrote this for me. Oh my gosh, they put my title in there. There's no way they could have automated this. Oh my gosh, my industry, my industry is in here right now. We look at that stuff and our immediate reaction is, could this have been automated? And if it could have been, our brains immediately default to it, it was. And that is one of those boxes. That's one of those emails that gets, you know, or, or one of those uh, things that we would check off and delete when we see it, right? Check it off, delete it. So I, I'm always cautious about using anything that could be put in a merge field, even on calls. If I'm like, oh, I'm calling about, you know, the laundromat vertical, like, you know, that, why? Like, that's, <laughs> that's like such a like weird, like, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't mention a vertical unless you specialize in that vertical only. Mm -hmm. I think that is the only reason when that's acceptable is when it's the only vertical that you sell to. Uh, but I, I would, I would probably not, uh, I would probably not stay on the phone after this one. Yeah, I, I like I love the spirit of it, um, but the execution. I feel like one of those things that I've done as an SDR when I wasn't confident was throw too many words in there to try and like sell my way into the, getting them to answer the question. I'm not really sure why, because now I know more words dilutes the message, and it also shows a lack of confidence. And so the, the I love the spirit of this because what they're saying. It, I think the response is, "Oh, we don't have budget." or it's not the right time for us. And I think the appropriate response here is like, that's great, uh, when's the right time? And kill the uh, but that's great, when's the yeah. right time? We had, we had yeah. one customer in the early days, we spent our entire time prospecting just doing this. They knew that everybody was locked up in five-year contracts. They said, I wanna know, are they renewing this year, next year, the year after, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you can give me that data, it would be the most valuable. We will pay you tens of thousands of dollars a month because these are million dollar contracts. Um, mm -hmm. So I love I love the spirit of it. Execution could use a little fine tuning. Kill some words there, hey Brian. I, I, feel, like, I feel like the shrink right there is, hey, listen, we specialize in your area, in your vertical, in your industry. I'll reach back out when the time is right. That's it. I don't feel like it needs to go any further than that. And again, we have this luxury of managing a pipeline, right? A lot of sales professionals don't have that luxury. You're going to mm -hmm. reach out to this person again, regardless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the ways that I've sort of tackled this in the past is going the route of now it doesn't work if it's like January 30th. And so they've just renewed their budget and they don't want to budge until next January. Like then I I'm with right. you, James, like you've got to reach back out later. But if it's like, it's like August and you know that in the, in the coming months, they're going to start to think about the budget for the following year and they what, what they want to spend it on. I think you can totally handle the budget objection and be like, fair enough. I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to sign the dotted line today, but what yeah. I want to show you is what some, like what could fit into your, your planning for these reasons that I've talked about these, these problems that could be solved when the budget does renew, is it worth exploring those options to see what's out there to see if you want to make room for it in next year's budget? Um, I like, I like that one. Cause then if you're an SDR and you put that in the AE pipeline, the AE is then the one that's got to follow up in right. <laughs> however many months, but you've still created a really good opportunity for them. Um, yeah. okay. 
We'll move on to the last one uh, that Kibran uh, submitted here. So this last circumstance is um, building value. <laughs> Kibran was saying autocorrect got me on that last one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the in indicatives, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's a tech term that I've never heard before. Mm. Um, okay. So building value into introducing my solution by mentioning two pain points. Okay. Okay. So like opening with some pain points to build, build some kind of like intrigue and interest in, in, uh, in that prospect. So John speaking with other blank leaders, they've mentioned that before using us, they had trouble with pain point or we're looking at other pain point, two pain points that that your solution specifically solves. Um, how familiar do these two situations sound? What do you guys think? I like the conversational discovery question at the end. I talk about this a lot. If you are selling a product that someone has to use Salesforce in order to use, that's your qualifier. Most sales reps have a tendency to be really aggressive with that ask. Hey, do you use Salesforce? How familiar are you with Salesforce is a better way to get them to open up and say, yeah, we use it every day. We're a Salesforce shop. You just qualified that entire organization versus do you use Salesforce where you just became the pitcher and they could see that pitch coming a mile away and they're ready to knock it down. So I love that conversational discovery question at the end. And I like how he's speaking with people like you. That part of it has the familiarity that I think resonates with a lot of people, especially when you're a seller and you talk to people that have the same title. Like we all have a persona that we shoot for a title um, in, a, in, a, in a specific industry or a specific company. There's a title somewhere. Some people sell to sales, VPs of sales. Some people sell to VPs of HR, right? Like what's your persona? So by using that, I talk to people like you all the time. I feel like that opens the door for that familiarity. I really like this one. Colin? Yeah, I mean, I think I I have nothing nothing more to add other than the only thing that I don't like about it is that you're you're adding you're stringing together a couple of pain points. I think you got to pick one um, because going with two muddles the muddles the attack, you know, like you want to be super yeah. crystal clear in the delivery. And if you say one and then, and they're like, and they go, Oh yeah, that resonates with me. And then you said the other, they're like, well, Oh no, that second one doesn't resonate. So you can kind of muddle yeah. your messaging. I'm a big fan of clarity, single, single thought, single, uh, sort of thread of like, pick the best one. Single pain point, single CTA, right? Exactly. Like yeah. if you have two question marks in your email, I'm going to nuke you. Um. <laughs> but I will say that I've gotten to a point on several cold calls where I've been able to say, okay, sounds like we have a really good conversation here. I've got about three questions I need to ask you, and then it can have a real conversation. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. No one says no. Everybody's yeah. like, yeah, shoot. It's like a human instinct. Yeah, go for it. For sure. And, I, and I think that's great later on, or like if you're asking for those yeah. three questions, but I think for like muddling in the delivery of a singular line, that's probably where I would focus yeah Go and ahead, overcoming Sarah. an objection is totally different too exactly i would disagree with that and the reason being that i think it depends on your what your company is offering and the use cases that are available for that person you don't necessarily have one pain point that you're solving every single time for that person and i think you alienate them if you shoot with just one and it's not the one that they feel they're not going to want to have the rest of that conversation because they're like oh this isn't for me it's not the solution for me i don't have that i don't need it whereas to come with like here are the buckets of pain points that I think you might be experiencing in your role from the experience talking with other leaders. Do any of those ring a bell? I think you do give yourself more opportunity there. And I'm saying this from experience um, dealing with some really, really complex offerings that some of our clients have and, and selling on their behalf. Um, and it's something actually Dave Kennett um, says on, a, on our next upcoming uh, episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast that will be coming Dave. out tomorrow yeah you interviewed him i just listened to write the blog the blog and he says go for two or three pain point buckets and ask them a, a question like this so i'm gonna i will put my neck on the line to my ceo and say no <laughs> i stand no. with you Hebron. <laughs> it's there's, there's while you were no... talking i muted you in zoom and i've just been playing music the whole time <laughs> so they didn't hear any of that <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's nothing better than coming to one of these types of things where we can all agree that we don't agree on some stuff. I think totally. what this points to, 
I think what this points to is the fact that there are no silver bullets. If you came to this thing looking for that magic thing to say that gets everyone to want to talk to you, you're going to be searching for that your entire life because everybody's different from day to day. Even if you're talking to the same human, they could feel totally different on a Thursday than they did on a Wednesday. That's mm -hmm. the nature of humanity. Sorry. Like the fact that you disagree is perfect for this conversation because totally. nobody likes to come to these things where everybody's just like, yeah, I totally agree. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Right. Like, Welcome to the group think podcast. That, that's okay. <laughs> There's a buyer out there for somebody that likes lots of pain points listed. I promise. Totally. Yeah, right. and hundred percent. There's somebody who goes like, "Oh, it's too much," and now I now it's muddled, and now I don't care. But it's absolutely worth worth trying both. Always, always worth testing. So manage the pipeline. Do it once one way. Do it once another way, and see which one comes out ahead. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Do you want to, Colin? You want to read out the Pablo uh, submissions here? Let's do it. So, just curious. People usually people tell me that because they want a nice way to say they're not really interested in ever getting together. Is that what you see happening here? Oh, I see. It's like they say, oh, oh, I don't really have time. And then you say, okay, usually people tell me that because they just want a nice way of saying they're not interested. Is that, yeah. is that, is that what's here? happening here? Yeah. Okay. Like send me some, send me some information. I think that's what's going on here. Send yes. me some information. Yeah. People usually say that when, uh, when they're, when they're not really interested, is that what's happening? Is that what's going on here? I like that. Mm. I love giving, give an option for no, give them yeah. the out, yeah. give them the power if they want it. Yeah, I like this one a lot too. Uh, giving somebody an out is great, but I also like the human side of this. That's out of all of them. This is the one that is most human for me because this, I think for me, if I was taking this call and someone said that to me, I would probably have to pause for a minute and be like, that's exactly what's happening here. I'm not interested <laughs> in your product. I appreciate you calling attention to that. Thank you for recognizing it. But I might also be like, so here's how Pablo handles that. That makes sense. I figured you weren't interested because you didn't return any of my emails. Honestly, if this wouldn't provide any value to, to your day to day, I wouldn't be calling you. Or I, if I didn't think this would add any value to your life, I wouldn't be calling you dot, dot, dot. Curiosity. Pablo, my, my response to you, Pablo would be, you don't know anything about my life, but thank you. <laughs> it's important. You don't get too personal too fast. <laughs> See, I, I like the I like the going in hot and heavy because most people are still throwing you an automatic objection at this point, especially if you're cold calling me and you happen to get me because I pick up thinking it's somebody else. I'm like, I just want to get you off the phone, mm -hmm. and not that I'm gonna lie to you, but I'm gonna say things just to get off you, get you off the phone because totally. you got the there's an eighth or eighth one thirty second of my brain right here that's reserved for dealing with cold calls, and I only engage this little tiny spot in my very tiny brain. And it's because I put my phone here. And so it's just this little gatekeeper in my brain that's listening. And I'll, I'll, he will say whatever the hell he wants just to get them off the phone because I'm trying not to lose the thread on whatever I'm doing on my computer. Yeah, I would yeah. be, I think I'm okay with the like, the, the hot and heavy being like, I wouldn't call you if I didn't see, if, see value here. But I think there needs to be something else after that. Mm -hmm. Like we can't end with that because then you're leaving your, it's the balls back in their court and they're going like, okay, well, but I don't think that there's value. So <laughs> my opinion is more valid because it's me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe this could have been replaced with the sec with the third line down. Mm -hmm. okay. Read us that one, Colin. Um, on your, your personal opinion, what, what should we stop or start doing to be a good fit with, for companies like yours? I really appreciate if you could help me understand what we could do better. Mm -hmm. So this is asking like, why don't you think we're a fit? Like, what are you seeing? Give, just give me, give me some, some insight onto why you think this is not a fit. Cause mm -hmm. then I guess you can handle the objections that come up. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is actionable right here. I feel like that ending right there would prompt me to be like, well, I don't even know what you do. Mm -hmm. Right. We mm -hmm. haven't even gotten there yet. So why don't we start there? Yeah. Right. And that would, that's probably how I would respond to that question. And I appreciate the fact that it was more about him improving, but that's the trainer in me. That's the coach in me Yeah, is like, oh, this person wants to improve. So I would gravitate towards that much more so because my whole mantra is to like help people grow and improve. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you came at me like that with your second line, instead of that second line that you have, I feel like that would open the door for me for the conversation in addition to the human aspect that came first. 
See, I, I, I'm going to agree and disagree with you. I think you're wrong to kill the second line. I do love the third line. I'll agree with you there. But I think you're totally yeah. wrong about the second line. I would, I would steal from you to show you how wrong you are. Because I think the first line is, is a sort of a pattern interrupt. Is, this what's, is that what's happening here? Right? Yeah. Now they're paying I attention. Agree. Right? Be like, hey, that makes sense. The reason I was calling, I'm going to steal your reason I was calling. And if it's very compelling, now you're testing, hey, is this, now that I have you mostly paying attention? And then if they still say no, the third step is asking for feedback. Hey, what could I have done better? Right? I think you're a fit, but you think you're not a fit. Is there anything I could have done better? I love this sort of three This is step actually nature. a really fair argument. And I appreciate you convincing me of that. <laughs> I think the my life comment was what bothered me. Yes. Mm. I think yeah, that I think personal fair. piece was what turned me off from that part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like assuming that this would provide value to you is not a good way to go, mm. but to, yeah, to my rather... life, my duties, like exactly. you, don't know anything about. you don't know if it's going to yeah. provide value. I may already have a solution there. I may not, not have budget for this. So I literally cannot, cannot take it on right now. There's so many reasons why it, you can't assume that it is going yeah. to provide value, but rather like Colin saying, give like a nice compelling, like customer story, a little pain point reference or something else mm -hmm. to, to, to replace this second um, step in this little process. Yeah. You, yeah. And you definitely don't want to go the pithy. Well, that's funny. I just sold this to your counterpart at competitor XYZ, which would be hilarious if you actually could say that, but probably not the right bomb to drop. But there's things that are funny. Go well. Yeah, there's things that are funny in my brain that are like, oh, that sounds good on a podcast or a stream that you absolutely should not try. So yeah. maybe James, <laughs> the th maybe the three of us will, will do that as a podcast. <laughs> things you should not, absolutely should not say. I'd love to do like a cold, like a live cold calling thing where you do like prank cold calls where you just say like the worst lines and see the responses that you get. Anyway, I, I, could put I used together. to have. Go ahead, James. I used to have this uh, caller that would call me twice a week and I never knew who they were because they never let me get far enough to find out, but they would call and they would go, hi, is Roland there? And I would say, I think you have the wrong number. And they'd go, oh, maybe you can help me. And then they would pitch me. And then at the end they would ask their ask and I'd go, what's my name? And they'd be like, what? And I'd say, what is my name? You asked for Roland and I told you you have the wrong number and you've spoken for the last three minutes. What is my name? And they would just hang up and they, they never gave me the chance to like keep the conversation going. Yeah, it was bad. That's hilarious. I kind of want to steal that though. And just like repeatedly call you be like, Hey, is Roland there? If you're listening now and you're yeah, trying to sell to James. Yeah, but I'd recognize your voice, Colin. <laughs> But James That's to say sweet. he puts his cell phone number all, all over the place. You could definitely find, if you're watching right now, you could find his cell phone number and you could call. I'll give it and to you. 305-632-6005. Call me anytime. There you go. And we go. know the way to James Hart. He's just explained the way that you could get, get through to him. So I, I'm expecting to hear about some cold calls. Cool. Um, okay. Last submission from Madeline Granados. Okay. So again, we're thinking this is like in response to some sort of objection of like pushing it off to later or, you know, don't want to chat right now. This is how to keep somebody on the phone. Um, I yeah. assure you that if you listen to our proposal, you won't regret it. We are growing all across the market and the world. I'm sure we can get something that can benefit you. And then if you don't meet, <laughs> if you don't, don't meet with me, I'll come after your family. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I did not expect that. Um, so Nobody they, mess with Madeline. Jeez, man. I've got to think that this is a, a joke submission, but wow. I, I, I added that, that last slide just a few oh. minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see if you would like, read Madeline, it. Madeline, what a left turn. It wow. started off really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, wow, it's so extreme. Okay. So forgetting that, I assure you that if you listen to our proposal, you won't regret it. We're growing all across the market and the world. I'm sure we can get something that can benefit you. Yeah. So my initial gut reaction says this is kind of a desperate attempt to stay on the phone. Anytime you have to assure somebody and say things like you won't regret it. There's like an element of questioning that you have to have internally that says, should I be making this sale? Should I be pushing this envelope further? If somebody is resistant to listening to you, forcing what you want to say to them is probably not a good way to rub them in that moment, especially because I don't think you've built enough rapport on a cold call, specifically on a cold call where they want to hang up 
I don't think you've built enough rapport to, to push back like this. If it's your fourth call, if it's your fifth call, and they're like, I don't know, I'm apprehensive, I'm questioning the validity, I don't know about the ROI, I have a lot of questions in my mind, you won't regret it, might be something that you would throw out there in that moment as like a quick cherry on top to be like, we know what we're doing, trust us. Uh, but in the in the initial conversation, I don't feel like this is a, a good route to go. I think you could probably cut that off and just go, look, we're growing all across the market and the world, and I'm sure we can do something to benefit you. Let's talk again next week, and I'll show you a little further what we do and how we do it. And this might be something you want to look further into. You could probably just take that off and start with where you are afterwards, and that would be a better beginning, I think, for this rebuttal. My my concern with this one is that it's like it's you focused not me focused like i don't care that you're growing like what that has nothing to do with me like not invested in that at all right yeah like (laughs) if i don't if i've said i don't have budget or i don't want to talk about this like i don't care that you're a fast growing company or that you've got like you all opened up an office in beijing last year like um i don't care it's got to be more focused to like the pain that you're solving for me um but i'm all for the like um you know, if, if you give me two seconds to just get through it, then you can decide whether it's a value to you to continue this call or not. I, I, I'm totally, um, all for the, like, you know, as like a hail Mary type thing being like, I know that I'm, I know it's a cold call. I know you don't want to be on this call. Can I have the two seconds to explain it? And then balls in your court. If you hate it, hang up on me. Um, so I like that sort of sentiment that is behind this. Um, but I, but yeah, I think it's, 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 it comes across as a bit desperate with the regret it. And, um, it's very you focused, which also feels like desperate or something. It's not like you're calling me specifically because you've done your research and you can see there's a fit and you've got the like hypothesis of pain you're going to solve or whatever. Um, yeah, those would be my, my notes on that one. I think this, I like the spirit of it and that you're trying to like reassure them but the the words i think are coming across maybe empty in this context without like maybe you would personalize that um like the that you're growing all across the world is a signal um i like the customer signal better because anybody can say oh we're growing all around the world um i think the i would to make this awesome i would take it to a level a little bit more specific and say you know like we've um you know like, I don't think the assure, I assure you, you know, if they almost feel like empty words, I think I would really focus on like, you know, I just, you know, we just worked with a company that's, you know, X and I think they're very, fairly similar. They got Y value right now. You're bringing in a customer story. And I think the words like this don't convince people. I think the one thing I've learned as a salesperson is you can't convince anybody of anything. You can't manipulate them. You can't, you can like get really excited about it, but they're only going to do it if they think it's valuable. And so saying, oh, I assure you, oh, you know, you're not gonna regret it, blah, 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 blah. Like that's not there, to me, those are empty words. And so I think personalizing this with a story about a customer of like, hey, you know, totally fair to be hesitant. You're acknowledging that how they're feeling about this. One of our customers, X, Y, Z, achieved this value after only, you know, Y period of time. Um, Do you think that'd be something that could benefit you? You know, and that now you're flipping it around and as opposed to just being the um, just a statement, now you're opening it up like, hey, can you see how that would work, you know, with your company? Um, So I like the spirit of it. I think there's like some some sort of tweaks and and some tune uh, tuning that we can make. Um, uh, My two cents. I think think we all have a tendency. I I agree with everything you said there, Colin, um, but I think we all have a tendency to kind of have this pushback that's a little bit over the top. Uh, one of the biggest objections that people get, I don't have time. Our instinct tells us to be like, you don't have time to look at my app that saves you time. That doesn't make any sense. Like, mm. <laughs> why? I don't understand why you would not have time to look at this app. It could save you time. Uh, but when you do that, what you're basically doing is you're stealing away their validity in their reply. And nobody likes to be unheard. Nobody likes to be dismissed. Nobody likes to have that person disregard what you've just said to them. And when you do that, even if what you have is the most needed thing in the world for that organization, a lot of decision makers as individuals will block you from moving forward as an individual because you rubbed them the wrong way personally with your reply. So it's real important that we walk that fine tightrope of 
providing value without being too aggressive and dismissing what the objections are that are coming our way. Objections are not meant to be overcame. They're meant to be heard and handled and acknowledged. And until we change that about the way we deal with objections, we're always going to have people that are real nice, but never buy from us. Fantastic. I think with that, how about we get to the voting? So yeah. chat, let me know. Hebran, uh, type of one, if you think Hebran had the best. Type of two, if you think Pablo uh, nailed it. And type of three, if you think Madeline is the, the ultimate winner, winner, chicken dinner. So we'll give yeah, you all I'll a minute. A, yeah, I'll do like a quick little recap of what um, what these these people uh, yeah, gave gave us in their in their lines to keep people on the phone. So Hebran, he had that. Um, imagine your calendar fills up quickly. Let's get a placeholder. If they say, you know, send me some more information. If they give you the budget or the time objection, he says, we're not looking to to actually make a decision today. We're looking to learn more about your efforts, um, and then you know, see if it makes sense in future. When is your budget being reviewed? And then finally, this last one I would say is more like an opener to me rather than a line that keeps keeps prospects on the phone. But it's the, hey, leaders like you experience two buckets of pain points. Do either of those ring a bell? Um, for Pablo, we have the, um, someone gives you that, that smokescreen objection and he says, hey, like people tell me that all the time. It's usually just because they don't want to talk. Is that true for you? Um, that second line that came in was like, I figured you weren't interested, but... I wouldn't be trying to reach out if I didn't think that this was valuable to you. And then the last line was, what should I, going for, for help or going for some feedback, what should I do better? What can a company like mine do better to, to be more appealing to a company like yours? And finally, Madeline's was the, um, the I assure you, if you listen to our proposal, you won't regret it. Um, you know, we're growing, uh, we're doing things as a company, we've got something that could benefit you. So. One for Hebron. And Colin added the, Pablo. if you don't meet with me, I'll come after your family. <laughs> yes. yes, we won't blame that one on Madeline. So one for Hebron, two for Pablo, three for Madeline. We'll give it like um, 30 more seconds. Awkward, awkward We're going to give it a few minutes. Do we get to tell people what our, what our choice is? Yeah, we're going to, once we get, um, yeah, like a 30 more seconds of votes in, then on the count of three, we'll all throw up our number at the same time. Awesome. Sweet. We've seen a good mix. Okay, we're gonna give you another ten seconds to get your um, to get your. You playing the in Jeopardy here. song? <laughs> and remember, guys, like the purpose of this one is keeping people on the phone. What do you think is gonna do the best job at keeping that person on the phone when they've said that they're basically they're like, I'm done with this conversation. <laughs> do 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 do. <laughs> All right. I think YouTube is also like a five seconds behind or a couple second delay. So we'll give them a couple right. more seconds to get in here um, okay. after our phenomenal Jeopardy renditions. <laughs> Hebran, yes, you can vote for yourself. Yes, absolutely. Totally. Okay. All right. So we've got a good spread of, uh, actually, I'd say the, the bulk of people are going for, uh, let's see, Hebran's got one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty clear favorite in, in chat here. Um, so we're going to do one, two, three, shoot. Uh, and mm -hmm. then the three of us will ignore all of chat and just pick our own. <laughs> Ready? Uh, one, two, three, shoot. Oh, oh. what? <laughs> two days in a row. Wow. What? <laughs> Pablo with the unanimous Pablo. decision. Oh, all right, job. buddy. This is hilarious. I think yesterday we all picked the same one and it was number two as well yesterday. Yes. Wow. Very true. Uh, James, why did you uh, awesome. like number two? Uh, I, it's the human aspect for me. I think that he has the most human approach and it's very emotionally driven. And I think that's the thing that's becoming quite useful in 2021 selling environment. How do I impact somebody emotionally and be very real with my delivery? And if I can't get where I want to go, I want to ask them for how I can improve on the next run. And that does, this does that really well. Despite my, my, my life and my duties hang up, I feel like this is the most human approach that would probably keep me talking to him on the phone. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what do you think? Yeah, I, 
I love this one because I think if, if we're thinking about the sole purpose of these lines um, as being to keep the prospect on the phone, we don't just want to keep them on the phone, but we want, we want to get them talking again. We want to get a response out of them. We want to continue the conversation. Keep them going. And I think yeah. this does a really good job at that. I think so many ways we handle objections is, as James was saying, just to like overcome it and be like, here's why that objection's wrong. And then you can't actually continue a conversation from that point. So the fact that Pablo's going like, hey, is it because of this that you're saying that? And then the person is going to answer your question probably with a yes. And it's sort of like, they may even get a little chuckle out of it and be like, you know what? You're totally right. Like, yeah, I'm totally just trying to blow you off right now. And it's like refreshing to, um, to be able to acknowledge that as like a positive and then, and then kind of move forward from it. So I think that, that this setup does the best job at, um, encouraging the, the prospect to continue the conversation, but about the objection rather than, you know, just overcoming it and blowing past it. Love it. Um, I, I was disappointed that you took the end bit off Madeline's, but you know, still, still a good one. Um, I think the thing I liked about Hebran's was I love the, I love the placeholder. Um, you mind if I shoot you a placeholder for this phenomenal When is your budget reviewed? Incredible. Um, how familiar are, are you with these solutions? Like this is a very, this is a very close second. If I could have picked two, I'd have picked these two for sure. Um, I think yeah. the, I like the pattern interrupt of, of Pablo's of like calling them out on like, this is probably bullshit. Like send me some information That's bullshit. Or is this just bullshit? Love that. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, I think that it flows really well together with, the uh, is this bullshit is sort of one sort of clear step. And then that might that opens up a real conversation and then the second piece you deliver that like hey this is why i think it's valuable that is another step of like getting into like a really meaty conversation and each of these are sort of checks if you don't make it there's other sort of branching routes you can go um yeah and then at the end i love the hail mary ask for feedback because sometimes it's just you know like they'll give you legit feedback and sometimes it's actually it's just another opportunity to clarify oh you meant you thought i meant this no no, no i was actually talking about that oh okay well that's a different story um, so I've used the, I've used two of these lines, uh, quite a bit myself. And that's why Pablo took it home for me. I want to give a quick, uh, rebuttal for the, will you send me some information that I use a lot? Morgan and I both do this. I think John does too. Um, and Megan and Leslie, we, we kind of, kind of adopted this as a standard. Anytime somebody says, will you send me an email? Will you send me some information? Our response is, what would you like in that email? Hmm. Most of the time, you're going to find these people have no idea what they want in that email. They don't even know why they're saying that. And that's a great opener for Pablo's, hey, you know, I, <laughs> you might just be like saying this to get me off the phone. Is that what's happening here? I, I think that that right there is that human thing that keeps people like, yes, okay, fine. Like, let's have a real conversation. I'm going to drop my guard here and I'm going to tell you, here's why I'm apprehensive about this conversation. I'm busy. I have other priorities. We don't have budget for this. We're not thinking about it. It's not a concern for us lots of reasons they might give you but i love the what would you like in that email as a precursor to this because sometimes people are like i don't know send me information <laughs> like that what's happening here right mm -hmm. like why are we on this call right now <laughs> totally sarah closing thoughts yeah honestly um i think there's a, a ton of takeaways from hebron's um uh offerings there for us i do think that those ones are like um, how to get the meeting, even if, even if it's going south or like how to keep the opportunity, if it feels like you're going to lose it, it doesn't feel quite like these lines that are to keep the prospect on the phone and talking. And that's why mm. Pablo took that for me. So I think great takeaways from Hebron. And I think as we chatted about with, um, Madeline's, uh, one there it's it could be something useful at a later stage it's not necessarily something that you can use on a cold call initially because it's maybe a bit too um ballsy for lack of a better word to, to say something like that to them um so early on but maybe like later in the conversation when they're as james was saying like hesitant around certain particular um certain parts of the deal they're like not sure about then you can go like hey if you give me a chance to explain why this actually would be a fit i promise you won't regret that you know the time and the the understanding of that um so i think great takeaways from everybody here um yeah i'm so grateful for the for the submissions you guys it's great right on yeah thanks to everybody that that put their names in and if you're you didn't get picked as a finalist uh we hope you'll consider uh doing it uh, coming back next year or next time we do this for take another stab at it 
um, even though we, you know, we were trying to trying to be critical of these, you know, all in the all in the spirit of helping ourselves get just a little bit better. I can't tell you what I would have given to be been able to submit some of my early messaging when I was a sales rep to to a live stream like this. So let's take a minute and appreciate like this was a ballsy move that everybody did to yeah. submit their messaging. And uh, hopefully we all get just a little bit better. And so in the spirit of SDR week, thank you for showing up. James, thank you for sharing all the valuable insights. I really appreciate you coming. Sarah, appreciate you being the co-host here. Um, the insight you know, from being an SDR and an SDR manager is incredible. Um, and thanks to the marketing team that put this together and everybody in chat that showed up and participated. You are all awesome. You're the reason that we do all this. And I hope you'll take, take time to join us tomorrow um, where we're talking about, Sarah, remind me, I think we're going back to emails. Beats me, Colin. Oh man, we uh, got- It looks oh, like we're doing- It's Dale Dupree. We've got some crazy yes. messaging. Woo! This guy That's is- my guy. He's bananas. We've got a really cool video uh, from him and we're basically talking about how to stop your boring outreach. So this is gonna be anything but boring. Dale is crazy, certifiably crazy in the most amazingly po amazing way possible. I love this guy. It's gonna be a great one. So don't, don't forget to dial in tomorrow and you better be using either a phone to dial in or a dial up modem. Otherwise I'll be very disappointed. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you tomorrow. Thank you, guys.